Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of our Golfing Society podcast. I have the pleasure and privilege this afternoon of being in the, the presence of uh, Julie Walker, who's the founder of Women on the Tee. And today we're hoping to explore the, the world of uh, women in golf and the future of women in golf, really. As, as you know, Golf in Society, we support lots of families that, uh, that, that uh, at the moment are going through challenges such as dementia, Parkinson's, loneliness and depression. And often within that family unit, we've got a lot of women that are picking up the, the pieces of being that unpaid carer. So we're going to really have a whirlwind conversation through where golf is at at the minute for women, where it, uh, where it could be in the future and how, I suppose, really, uh, there's the huge opportunity out there to, for the golf industry. And, and for the wider wider society as a whole to embrace the huge opportunity that the healthy ageing market is is going to going to bring in the future. So, without further ado, uh, Julie, welcome to the the Golfing Society podcast. Thank you, Anthony. Nice to uh, be here this afternoon. And uh, Julie, just for just just for the audience, uh, how long have you been playing golf? Um, I played for a couple of years in my late teens, and then I've really been playing properly for about the last eleven years. And what's the best part of your game? Um, on a good day, my putting. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. It's probably one we don't all uh, practice as much as we should do either, is it? No, but I do. When I get my eye in, I'm pretty handy. So that's quite good. It helps with the scoring. <laughs> and, and also, if you don't mind me asking, uh, which part of Scotland are you from? Um, the west of Scotland. Um, so Ayrshire. So just north of Trin. Come from a place called Irvine. Fantastic. No, it's uh, there's plenty of golf courses around there. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks again for your time today, and I, I hope you're going to enjoy this conversation as mu as much as I'm hopefully going to enjoy it, and I'm sure our listeners will too. So we're going to dive uh, straight into the first part, really. And at the minute, for for wider society as a whole, what what do you think the biggest barriers uh, to women discovering and enjoying golf are at the moment? Well, I think your um, use of the word discovering is probably the the key to um to getting into golf actually and i think that's one of the biggest challenges so if we sort of look at the first point of um access for anyone to learn about anything today is about the internet and so therefore the window to any organization or sport or any environment is the internet is Google, it's looking at websites, it's learning about what an experience is going to be when you come into that environment. And if we sort of look at um, a golf club's website or if we look at a national governing body's website, you know, we ha you, you're, there's information on the national governing body's website, but it doesn't really tell you very much about golf and what being a golf it, golfer is and what the experience of golf is. Then we come down from sort of the governing bodies down to counties who basically are responsible for creating the county wide and supporting the county, the, the golfers and the golf clubs within the counties. And once again, we don't really find out about what actually playing golf is about. We find out about teams, we find out about diaries, we find out about schedules, we find out about events, we find out about news. But what does that actually mean? It doesn't really give us an insight into what it is. And then we move down into a golf club. And then when we start to look at golf club websites, um, you know, the messaging and the communication on those, are it's, it, it doesn't tell you anything. You know, you see a picture of a, a green piece of mown lawn. You've got a hole in the middle of it with a stick and a flag sticking, you know, a flag waving about. What does that actually mean? What does being a member of that golf club mean? We go across to the membership. We look in the membership. And it tells me that I can be a full member or I can a five day member or I can be a junior member. But what does that mean? And I think when you talk about discovering golf, the biggest barrier for anyone, it doesn't make any difference whether it's a woman, whether it's a junior, whether it's a man, whatever background or anything else. It's like the communication and messaging employed by the golf industry is the biggest barrier to accessing sp the sport today because it is not tailored to anyone coming to visit, to learn, to find out about and to understand what the experience of golf actually is. I think that's a fascinating start to the conversation and I agree wholeheartedly with you. I think we're very good at talking to ourselves 
but we're not uh, good at talking to the wider population or wider society or wider communities, really, who have never even been to a golf course, uh, let alone even tried to play this game. So that pathway of discovery for them, I think, needs to be reimagined and, and maybe imagined for the first time. Because I always say to people, just imagine you've landed on planet golf and you've never wow. been here before. So you've landed on this planet in your in your spaceship. What does uh, this planet look like? And I think that if we can all take it back to walking with a fresh perspective through that that first ever ever visit to a golf course, I think that's a really really good starting point. Because as you can imagine, Julie, we we encourage a lot of uh, families living with cognitive impairment. Uh, visual impairment, facing whatever challenge it might be later in life, to come to a golf club for what we call a taster session. So for a lot of people, that can be quite a, oh yeah, quite a challenging experience. I'm going to a golf club. I've heard so much about them. They, you know, they're quite exclusive. I've got to be dressed well. That you know, I've got to behave well, and all those types of things. So they're already potentially a little bit nervous about coming there. So I think for the audiences that we support in particular, it's really, really important that, that that first touch point is a welcoming one that gives them the confidence to take the second step. Yeah, I agree. And I also think that one of the one of the things one of the key things about golf is that golf is a rules led environment. And it doesn't make any and it is one hundred percent rules led. So these are the rules which allow you to access a golf club. These are the rules that you have to adhere to in order to get out of your car, get onto a car park and access our our facilities, whatever that is. These are the rules you have to adhere to on, on a golf course. These are the dress conditions. These are the rules. Now, I I love playing golf and I like being able to hit myself against somebody else and follow the rules on the golf course and be able to know that we're all working towards those rules. But I don't need somebody to tell me all of these rules about how to behave when I turn up at that environment. What I want to do is I want to come into an environment that has a value system that I engage with and whose values are reflect my values. So welcoming inclusive and um, friendly um you know helpful um experience based so all of these things are positive affirmations that i've made the right choice to come into this venue in order for me to experience and enjoy my time on a golf course which depending on where you are in your golf journey whether it's coming in to have a bit of fun in a driving range and you use this club and you hit this or whether it's going off to practice or whether it's in a competitive environment though there are certain things that you have to do you have to you can't hit a ball at somebody else you have to hit it off into any any a space that's there so that you're not going to injure somebody there are certain rules you have to adhere to however there are those should be adhered to but it's the value system and it's the atmosphere and the welcomingness of the environment, which is the one that allows me to know that I'm happy there and that this is receptive to me coming in as an individual, whatever my background. I think that's uh, that's that's great insight, that. And the, the, the second point I mentioned in, in the sort of uh, the early bit, and you've touched on it a little bit, is the enjoyment thing, because you've discovered it. You've managed to find your way in. You've had that welcome. It's been a good one. And now you're ready to give this wonderful game a go. And we all know that it is perceived as one of the most challenging and difficult games you you can ever play in life. So, again, there's probably a little bit of, um, you know, sort of uh, agitation, a little bit of nervousness about giving this game a go. And I, I think it's like everything in life. If we have a f- an enjoyable first experience, we'll come back for more. So I think that that first enjoyment of golf is really important too. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think it's that welcomingness, but I think it's also about recognising that the person that or the group that you're with recognise you or accept you or there's some way that you identify with them in order for you to basically just let let yourself or allow yourself to enjoy the experience 
and to um, basically embrace the experience that's being made available to you and get on with it. And I think that's one of the things. So uh, there's two things. So you have to feel comfortable and welcomed. But then once you're there, who you're with, the person that's leading the um, if it's a get into golf or if it's a golf experience or if it's a competition, whatever it is, whatever the event is, the um, you have to feel comfortable with that environment. And also you have to allow yourself to enjoy it, because I think sometimes people don't. No, I, I fully agree with that. And I, I, you touch on something again, really important there, that that togetherness is really important from day one. So if you've got people all going through the same sort of learning experience together, then there's that camaraderie from day one. There's that supportive environment from day one. And it's amazing how you see these little bits of moral support coming. Oh, don't worry so much. Yeah, we'll, you know, we'll try this or whatever it might be. But they, from day one, they're sort of helping each other. So there's the obviously there's the coaching going on, but between themselves they're actually supporting each other to hopefully have the enjoyment. But from day one, I think those uh, relationships build. Yeah, I I completely agree with you, and I think one of the things is is that I think with um, an initiative like Golf and Society, where you're bringing people together who have been adversely affected by an illness or by dementia or loneliness or depression, whatever whatever the reason that has brought people to it. One of the challenges, I think, with when people have a chronic illness or have something like loneliness or depression or cancer, or whatever, whatever that is, is that the help available is very much about come over here and talk about your negative experiences with this illness, with this condition, and, and do that. When you create an environment where you're bringing people in together and saying, you're here because you're impacted by this experience, by this illness, by this condition, by whatever it is, you are here because the thing that has brought you into this environment, which is giving you the new opportunity to meet new people and to learn something together at the pace of the group, that in itself is a positive outcome from them having this condition or illness or um, challenge at this point in their life. And that is one of the things that when you create an environment like that, it allows being able to support people who you don't have that condition. You may not have anyone in your family with that condition, but that group of people coming together and experiencing something positive from a negative thing that they're in gives them relief for many, many reasons. Do you think that uh, the, a lot of the, the, the challenges and barriers that we that, that that we have to people accessing the games, especially women, are they UK or are they global barriers? And and if if they are, it's a yes or no whether they're UK or global. But really, what I was going to ask you also is, you've travelled the world in, in in your careers and and playing golf probably as well. Have you come across any sort of countries that are a really good exemplar of making golf welcoming and accessible? Well, to be fair, when I've travelled and worked, I didn't really play golf. So my experience has predominantly been in the UK. And I think, but I think that there is some really, really good pockets of um, examples of making people welcome. In Australia, there is a very big women's golf leaders network where the women, there are women who are in executive positions running uh, golf clubs around Australia who are all coming together and forming a network. Um, in order to make golf more accessible to women and more accessible to women as a career. Um, in Australia, the um, the governing bodies have all come together and they've created a thing called Vision 2025, where the PGA, the uh, Ladies Europe, the Ladies um, Professional Golf Association, or WPGA, the Women's Golf Professional Association of Australia, and also Golf Australia have all come together as governing bodies working on the same board together in order to make change. So when you have, um, in the UK, we have siloed um, siloed, siloed governing bodies that don't work together and they don't, they you know, they do their own work in their own way and sometimes they repeat the stuff. In Australia, you see an example of where they're all coming together and they've been doing that now for about five or six years. So I think yeah, Australia could. is one of the places that I would look to to, um, as an example of of bringing things together and making it more accessible, that that's brilliant. And and to finish off the first part of our conversation, Julie, it's 
this uh, this whole thing about how do how do we open up the game to women from more diverse backgrounds and make them de- uh, sorry help them to discover but also when they discover it make it enjoyable for them um i think it's about making sure there are other people like them on websites i think they're making sure there's other people like them who are teaching them who are coaching them who are you know part of that the community that they come into there are a huge number of women who are welcoming and want people to come into the golf community but they tend to be working as as individuals they're not there isn't there isn't a way that has brought them together as one network in order to make change together as a collective community so you'll have a pocket here and a pocket there and a, you know all over the place that's not just in this country it's it's sort of probably globally um, and you have men as well you know you have great allies male allies in the golf industry who are very pro um, pro women golf and they they work very hard in order to make it accessible so I think it's about how do we bring that community together and support that community because as an individual doing something on your own you have very limited um, you have limited resources limited time and limited access but if you can create a global community um, of people making change in golf and support them and give them the tools and the resources in order to enable them to do their thing better, then then I think that that's the key to making it work. United we stand. I think that's uh, that's that's great. That and I have come across a couple of great organisations recently, the Muslim Golf Association, who are doing some amazing work in getting uh, people from that from that that Muslim community to come to golf clubs for the first time and then to make sure that it's an enjoyable experience and tailoring it to you know their cultural needs uh, yeah. and and their and their backgrounds really so really thinking differently about what that whole enjoyable experience looks like around things that are very important to them in their lifestyles and you know their cultural backgrounds yeah, and I and I'm I'm aware of them, and I'm also aware of Love Golf, which is set up by Alistair Spink, which was about a bunch of um, PGA coaches, and he's got a program in place about making golf more accessible and how easy it is to bring, make it easy. You just turn up the pair of jeans, and um, trainers, you get out on a course straight away. You don't need a golf club, and he makes access to golf very easy. And I think that there's a lot of initiatives that we can do, but. I think um, acquiring and retention are two different skill sets. So we can create lots of programs to acquire people into an industry. But what we then need to do is ensure that we create experiences and pathways for them, which are social, competitive, health benefits, whatever those different pathways are. Um, and they need to be available throughout the, the golf industry from clubs to counties to national. And so it's not just about being an elite golfer. It's about... How do we create a pathway? So when, you know, one of the biggest things is when you go and join a golf club, somebody goes, all oh, right, OK, the women play on a Thursday. Oh, great. Thanks. What does that mean? You know, but why don't you say, welcome to our golf club. What are you looking for out of your membership? Oh, well, actually, the women that enjoy social are here or this is the dementia group or this is this other group and this is here. And then you've got this and this. And once you start to open up, your different pathways based on what people's expectations are for coming to join a golf club. Is it somewhere you want to be every week? Is it somewhere that you want to get fit with? Is it somewhere you want to compete? Have you competed in other sports up until now and want to continue competitive spirit? What are the reasons that you have come here and how can we help you enjoy your experience when you come to this club? And how can we show you what's available to you beyond our club within the golf community in order for you to enjoy your experience as much as possible? I couldn't have put that any better myself. That is completely turning it on its head. What can we do to make sure that you have the most enjoyable, long-lasting, rewarding experience rather than saying this is what's available for you? And we've had to do very, something very, very similar in terms of how we've sort of co-designed and co-created our services we, we could have easily gone out and said this is what's available for you if you've got a, if you're in a family unit you're being touched by one of these challenges this is what's available but we didn't do that well we did initially and it didn't work very well so what we did is we said well what do you need what would work best for you how would you get the most out of the experience and from that 
feedback we got from our customers, that completely transformed the way we ended up designing and delivering the services. And that's why we have people now who only leave really because of uh, a real big change in their care needs or their lifestyle or sorry, their life situation. They don't leave because they're not enjoying themselves, but that's only happened because we had to completely reverse the way that we thought about uh, designing the service. Yeah, and I think that's the the thing. I mean, where golf as an industry is very hierarchical. So the RNE tell the national governing bodies what to do. The national governing bodies tell the counties what ideas they've got, and then they ask them to go and ex- execute their ideas. And then the counties go to the clubs, delegates who then go to the clubs, who then go to the committees, who then go to the the subcommittees and say, well, this is what we're going to do. So by the time you've done that, you've diluted absolutely everything. So, but at the end of the day, the person that's delivering the the, the experience is, is the club. And so we need to tip it on its head and say, you know, who are our customers? Who are the people who are playing golf every week? Who are the people who are playing golf every month? When are they playing? What are they doing? How are they enjoying their experience within the club, beyond the club, in a county, beyond a county and associations? Whatever it is, what do people do in the world of golf? And how can we how can we capture what, understand what those experiences are? How can we then share those experiences across all of our network and all of our community to ensure people learn about how we can turn golf from being a top-down, rules-based organizational organizational structure to a customer centric how can we help you enjoy your experience of golf whoever you are wherever you are and whatever your ability is and whatever you're looking for from golf that is a fantastic way to end the first part of our conversation so on to the second part of our conversation today uh, Ju- julie and i are dis- uh, discussing and and exploring the the, the different uh, ways that we can get hopefully more women to enjoy this wonderful game we call golf. And we've started by looking at some of the barriers and hurdles that we have to overcome and offering up a few suggestions about how we can maybe think differently about getting more women from different backgrounds enjoying this wonderful game. So in the second part, uh, Julie, we're going to move on to an audience that we cherish very uh, very closely at Golf in Society, and that's the unpaid carers. And the reason that I cherish them so so fondly and so passionately is that they're my unsung heroes of society because without them, I wouldn't like to think where we would be as a society in terms of looking after our ageing population, especially loved ones living with a, a life-changing condition. Because if the government had to pick up that bill of 192 billion, which is what unpaid carers currently contribute to the, uh, you know, the economy every year, then you know our health and social care system wouldn't just be um, failing; it would be completely broken and and not functioning at all. So they're very important to us, and in everything we do at Golf in Society, we put the person with the diagnosis, but. As importantly, if not more importantly, the unpaid carer at the heart of everything we do. And in society, the majority of carers are women. That's just the nature of it. It ultimately, when a caring requirement comes within a family unit, as I say, ultimately, it's the women that that, that pick up that role uh, within within that family. And I've come across a lot of carers in particular that have played sport and probably played sport until this diagnosis came uninvited into their lives. And then they have to give up their favourite things. And one of the favourite things that has to go by the wayside is playing sport. And some of the ladies we support have obviously played golf as well. And that has to, unfortunately, sometimes go by the wayside. So really, um, with, with that in mind, We've opened up golf clubs for carers to enjoy respite, their weekly, reliable, regular break uh, from the challenges of being a carer. We've introduced them to people going through similar challenges and they've created some wonderful friendship networks and everything else. And with that in mind, it's just really, do you think there's there's much more uh, or how much more can the golf industry do and golf clubs do to support 
this particular audience, unpaid carers, to enjoy that that sort of happier, healthier, more resilient life that they deserve? Well, I mean, I think it's, I sort of agree with you. I think that there needs to be some way that um, golf and, you know, other sporting environments and leisure organisations that actually do support and keep paid pay carers because at the end of the day, they are the people that are looking after their families and their, their relatives at, at, at this very difficult time. And, and they, more than anyone else, need respite. You know, they need a break. They need some some time away. They need something something different. And I think golf offers offers that. Um, and I think one of the things that needs to happen is, is that, you know, we're doing an awful lot to get juniors into golf and we're giving discounted membership and we're giving discounted, you know, access to courses and whatever else. And so, you know, maybe clubs should have an unpaid carers membership. Um, in a golf club where if you can demonstrate that you are an unpaid carer, you know, you you, you don't need to be, you, it's unlikely you're going to be playing at eight o'clock in the morning because you're going to be giving the person you're caring for breakfast. But you might be getting them out to a breakfast club or a dementia club or something else in the afternoon. So maybe thinking about having, an, a, you know, a, a carer's membership, which gives you access to the course at times which are probably are lighter on use by members or guests or visitors or whatever else. And that may be something that could be made accessible. And if you come through that route, then there could be a, you know, get into golf for, for carers. Maybe it's not one club. Maybe it's a group of clubs within a local area where they basically say, what we'll do is we'll we'll have a, a carers Monday. And therefore that carers Monday is, as they come along and depending on what level of, um, golf you're at, you can come in, join a group, get nine holes of golf, cup of coffee, whatever else, and maybe you do it across six different courses and over the course of six weeks you play six different places with the same group of people at a discounted rate and therefore you end up having a community and you get experience and, and it, it's not it doesn't become a burden for one club because clubs are like, oh, I can't give you access, but once every six weeks is not such a big deal if you're giving... 10 tea times once every six weeks to some people who are doing some care in their own families and communities. So I think there's a lot of ways that, you know, you could be very innovative about providing support to to carers. And at the end of the day, you know, you know, 18% of um, golfers in golf clubs are probably 70 and over, 70, 75 and over. Mm. Therefore, you know, and there's a huge chunk of them between 50 and, and 70. So we're very much in the caring generation, um, either needing or giving. And therefore, maybe as that is a vast proportion of the uh, the golfing community, maybe we should be thinking a little bit more laterally about how we support and help those those individuals who who are in our golf community um, and fulfilling those roles. Yeah, and I think that that's the unpaid care audience, but there's that whole audience as well, because uh, we all know that there's a higher prevalence of women developing dementia. They, they, they live longer, so the chances of them de uh, developing a dementia in particular are, are greater. But there's that whole group of women golfers at the moment that unfortunately, are in the firing line of developing one of these challenges such as dementia. Yeah. And I think about this uh, from, you know, a male golfer's perspective. I think, am I a good male golfing citizen that if one of my group who I've played 20, 30 years with, if this came his way, would I be willing to step up and support this lifelong friend enjoy his favorite thing for as long as possible and i'm pleased to say that the answer for me would be yes but i could only do that because i i i'm skilled in understanding how to give that best support and i i, I wonder whether or not there's a piece of work to be done around upskilling and educating women playing golf that when that moment comes within their usual four ball their usual weekly competition wherever it might be that they are all well positioned to keep that person enjoying their favourite thing for as long as possible, even when a diagnosis has been given. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point because I think that um, it is about sort of upskilling um, 
But I think it's also about sort of educating and removing fear. I think one of the one of the chat, especially if you are, it's especially a lot of females. Then you know if something goes wrong, what they'll tend to do is they'll go and hide. You know they won't want their friends to see that they are not very good or that they may be impaired in some way, and so. You know, so sometimes it's um, interesting to sort of, to um, how do you, how do you become aware of something changing in someone's life? And I think it, it, you know, there are definitely clubs out there, and I think there's a lot of like community clubs that I can think of. My local one here, which is a small nine hole course, and the women play golf every Tuesday, and they do have a bit of a roll up on a Thursday. They also play bridge. And so there is an expectation that people are going to turn up every week. And if they don't turn up, then somebody says, oh, have you seen Carol or have you seen, Fred, you know, Mary or whatever? And if somebody hasn't, then somebody may go and they live on their own. Somebody may go around and find out where they are and they might have fallen or they might have slipped or they might be OK. Or they might just have been a bit bad that day and feeling a bit rough and they haven't turned up or whatever. Or they've forgotten or they've started to forget. And it's when <laughs> you have to have regularity of activity in order for people to notice that you haven't turned up. And so it's about creating that environment which is aware, number one, that something's changed in that person's behaviour. And number two, how do you, how do you as an how do you as a group have an open and honest conversation about what what's happened or if something's happened how do you do that and I think that's one of the the challenges because women and men, we're very good at hiding what's going wrong you know and so therefore um it might take a bit of effort for people to go and actually be brave enough to go and knock on that person's door and find out if they're okay and then welcome them into that community and find a way to support them but once they've done it it's fun but it's that it's 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 that crossover of going from she's okay we're not very sure oh now we know what's wrong now we can help the industry definitely needs to do more because i could spend the whole podcast talking about the horror stories that i've heard of as to why people have been lost from golf and one of the one of the, the biggest reasons is that they didn't feel confident enough to have a conversation about what was going on in their lives and I think as as as, a, as something that calls itself a club, uh, at the end of the day, we are members. We're all part of a club. We're all in this together. That's why we join a club and become part of something, have that sense of belonging and everything else. I think it's something that we need to work much, much harder at, of being there in those moments of need. Now, I know we are with certain things, don't get me wrong, but with these cognitive uh, challenges in particular which manifest themselves sometimes slowly sometimes in changes of behavior and everything else do we really understand how to have that first conversation when one of those changes in behavior in particular first manifests itself and i don't think we are and i think we need to do a lot more about being more sensitive more insightful uh, more understanding more compassionate when those first conversations need to take place and that's not just women playing golf, that's golf club teams, that's uh, the PGA professionals, all these people that are the touch points that can sense when someone's behaviour or uh, or emotional uh, state has changed. I think we need to do a lot more there. Yeah, I, I agree um, 100% on that. But I think, I, I think the honest answer is, in my honest opinion, I think that at the heart of this is golf is a rules based environment which is also a rules based behavior environment so how you behave is based on the rules that are imposed by clubs or counties or competitions or environments or academies or ju whatever or junior camps whatever it is and and therefore, because people are conditioned within golf to adhere to the rules, the, the challenge is, is that we need to make people be about the values and the values of being a human being and the values of compassion and the values of empathy and the values of conversation and trust 
an openness. And, and I think that if we can switch away from, oh, that person's not behaving particularly well, or that person's behaviour's changed. So what we're going to do, instead of actually sitting down and working out what, having a conversation and asking if there's a problem or if there's a way to help or whether whoever that is within that golf community, then if there's a way that, you know, it's it, we're not, this isn't about imposing a rule because you behave badly. It's about going and understanding why your behaviour's changed. And though that's a very different thing. And so I think that we're very good at imposing rules because somebody has broken our behaviour rule or our golf rule rather than, oh, that person looks upset. They're a bit nervous on the course. They're not so comfortable today. They've come in and instead of having coffee after it, they've shot off. They haven't talked all the way around the golf course. They're in a bad mood. Whatever that is, that change in behaviour, that change in the in their persona is a signal that something is wrong. And so it's about how do we then look at being able to have those conversations and those conversations are very difficult because sometimes somebody will go actually I'm fine there's nothing wrong with me it's fine and you find out later on they've been diagnosed with cancer or they've got dementia or their partner has or this has happened or their their aging parent is seriously ill or they've just died or whatever we don't have that space in our world to cope with things that aren't right and I, and I agree with you there, but I, I think that women in golf in particular have got a, a major, major part to play in this because women generally, are, are, I mean, you talked to earlier about, you know, bottling things up and coping and all that sort of stuff. I think women generally will talk more openly about things rather than men. Men are quite uh, stoic and and, they're, and, and, I, and I think women can help the men playing golf and the male memberships and the male industry leaders and the um, and people working in the golf industry to to understand those more sensitive compassionate things that are required when having those first conversations or being a little bit more intuitive about a changing behavior and something else because i think women can play a leading role in changing that whole agenda about how we first identify that something has changed then put that that wrap around an arm around the individual to say, don't worry, no problem at all. You know, we, we, yeah, you can still play with us on a Thursday morning or you can still do this or whatever. We'd still love you to be involved and, you know, make them feel still part of something special rather than thinking they're now in a position where they can't be part of that. I think women have got a huge part to play in that. I think they do have a role to play in that, but I still, I don't believe that, um, I don't, I think that, they, they they do and they probably behave like that in some clubs. They don't behave like that in all clubs. So therefore, I think that um, the go the golf environment has not been particularly welcoming and supportive of women. So therefore, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, res- there's there's big divisions in golf clubs. Women and men behave differently. They have different golf experiences. They don't um they don't necessarily communicate particularly well and and the experience of women in golf clubs isn't isn't necessarily as warm and cuddly as it as it should be because they've not they've been sidelined by the golf industry for such a long time and it's not and so therefore they're very protective of their their world and they won't they won't expose their world to the to to the rest of the club for fear of being vulnerable so you know that's also one of the the challenges if you are part of a minority in a club which which women are a minority in golf clubs and that minority has been pushed to the side and that minority is um under scrutiny all the time for having for doing something that doesn't adhere to the club rules, because if they don't, something will be taken away from them, then that community will stick together, but it won't come out to the wider golf club because it's predominantly male and and that's where the majority is. And they're not going to come and make men warm and cuddly because the men haven't been welcoming to them in the club. So, you know, that's traditional in history and everything else. And there's, 
And until we get to that point where women feel feel accepted and comfortable within a club environment, you're not going to get them to be the leaders in empathy and compassion within a club because up until now they have not been allowed to be. Yeah, that's uh, that's a that's a very fair, fair and valid valid uh, point. It's, it's a big uh, it's a big hurdle to over, over, overcome that. But I, I think if I go back to I suppose they're not the traditional golfing audiences, but the unpaid carers who are discovering golf clubs and the, the beautiful hospitality spaces that they have for the first time through our services, then they're, they're actually quite amazed at how welcoming they are. Obviously, we we only work with clubs that have the right ethos. So yes. some of the more, let's say, conservative traditional clubs that maybe that welcome wouldn't be great. We don't sort of do business with uh, for for those reasons mainly. Yeah, uh, but when these unpaid carers come into these environments, they can't believe how welcome, how friendly the hospitality staff now know them by name. They know what they want to drink. They get you know and make them feel as though they're they're, they're just like a nor- no, normal. They're like every other member. There's nothing different about them, but they feel really comfortable. And as a result of feeling comfortable in that environment, they open up and they share. With each other, their challenges, their laughs, their life stories, their holidays, all in that golf club environment. And it's become the highlight of their week. In a busy coffee shop in the middle of a busy town, you can't always have those really great conversations. Golf clubs have got some beautiful spaces for unpaid carers in particular just to kick off the shoes relax with like-minded people going through similar challenges and have those open, honest uh, uh, conversations. And the good thing is these ladies don't even go anywhere near the golf course, but they're using the golf club to facilitate them feeling a bit better and more resilient about life. Yeah, no, I have a neighbour in a neighbour in my street who she doesn't play golf, never played golf, and her and her friends have a social membership of a golf course where they go to once or twice a week and they have coffee because one it's um it's a nice environment two the coffee's quite good three it's in the middle of this green space in the west southwest of london and um it's near hampton court and so you know you have they have these spaces which are available now you know going back to that how do we make unpaid carers welcome maybe there's an, an unpaid carers social membership that clubs can have where they offer like a Monday afternoon coffee for unpaid carers where you come in and you do that. You know, there's a number of mechanisms that you can do in order to um, use these spaces. And and the thing about it is, is when it doesn't make any difference which type of club. If you go into a club where people are receptive and they said, welcome to come in here, whether it's a traditional club or a more um, community club, then people enjoy other people enjoying their environment because they are generally proud of their environment and they generally want people to enjoy it when they come in there because they enjoy it themselves. So there, there is the, you know, there is that side of it is that once you bring somebody into that environment and people there start to see them turning up and the change, then that makes a massive difference. A number of years ago, I set up a an initiative for women recovering from cancer to learn to row. And it was an eight-week programme at my local rowing club. And the first week I had no volunteers. By the eighth week, I had more volunteers than I had people attending. That's fantastic. And it was because they saw the experience that people who were brought together through having cancer were having and they wanted to be part of that. They didn't want to interfere in those people's experience. What they wanted to do was they wanted to support them and enable them to enjoy the rowing club and to enjoy that experience and to be part of that. And that was amazing. And there was one woman there who had ovarian cancer for the fifth time. And her oncologist told her that she has never been so sick, but she has never been so healthy. Mm. And she died within 12 months. And it was like, and everybody was very sad. And it was quite a tough, tough thing. But to know that in her last year, 
she was Polish and she and she was very big and she wore the smallest life jacket and she couldn't swim but and she could hardly get on the boat and somebody had to bend down to let her to get into this wide boat that allowed them to allowed you to learn to row and her family came over from Poland to see her row and that was huge for them and at the end of that course the enthusiasm and the passion and everything else for that course was incredible um, and it went on to run for another couple of years and then different things happened and it's, it still runs of, of a fashion but it was um, but that bringing people together in that environment and it and it's about and at the beginning it's like oh you can do it if you have to but don't get in our way and then all of a sudden at the end of eight weeks you have a club and a community who all want to be part of it because they can see what it does. That's a fantastic story. That that's a wonderful, wonderful way to finish the the, the second part of our great conversation today. I'm sure the audience are enjoying it as much as I am, Julie. So welcome back, uh, listeners, to the the final part of this great conversation I'm having with uh, Julie Walker today about uh, w- women in golf, the future of women in golf. Uh, unpaid carers and how golf clubs can support unpaid carers and basically how we can get more people from that wider community uh, involved in dis- in discovering and enjoying this wonderful game we call golf, uh, especially women. Yep. So the third part of this conversation, Julie, is looking really for, for a few opportunities and a few things, hopefully, that the golf industry can consider embracing and what also – success looks like for getting more women to enjoy this amazing game we call golf uh, that, that that we enjoy, that we enjoy so much yeah. so the the first thing really is the healthy aging market is probably the biggest growing market out there at the minute in terms of the care economy people living with chronic illness uh, inactivity levels uh, wanting to do more about getting more people more active more often and also and and also the limited uh, amount of resources we have available to deliver the growing amount of uh, health and care needs that our older population are um, are, are facing at the moment and and we face as a nation in terms of servicing those those needs so as you know golf clubs have got brilliant green spaces and we all know the importance of having access to green space but in addition to that They've got some fantastic built bits of infrastructure, and I, I'm thinking about the clubhouses in particular, which are obviously great places to socialise and, and have, and have a, a great conversation and uh, a, a great time with friends. So from an f- infrastructure perspective, I think that uh, golf seems to have quite a lot of the infrastructure that's required to give people the opportunity to live that happier healthier life uh, but do you think the the golf industry is well positioned at the moment to embrace this amazing opportunity on their doorstep i think i think there are pockets of the golf industry that are i think there's a lot of people who are rethinking the golf experience um and i think there are you know traditionally it was oh you know here's a golf club you come and play golf and hey we, we have some societies and some visitors and they were going to do a few weddings and funerals to supplement our income and that's absolutely fine however i think that there are more people coming in who are rethinking what golf should be and if they have the space they are rethinking what the facility should look like and they're putting in driving ranges with Trackman and Top Tracer or they're putting in, um, you know, a, a sort of coffee area or they're creating um, initiatives which allow people to be able to come in and use the space in a different way. And um, they're encouraging people to come in and work work from golf golf clubs. They're encouraging people to come in um, and socialise and, and, and use the venues in a different way on a regular basis. And and I think that there is there is an openness um, to looking at how to leverage the 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 venue in a different way, you know, if you take somewhere like the Royal Norwich, who basically have you know changed it from being a golf club to being a family destination with golf and coming to have meals and being part of a sort of social environment, or you look at um, you know the diff, you know different types of golf clubs around the country and 
you know, hotels or, or different venues. And each different venue now is looking at what makes it unique, but also what can it do in the community to be more diverse in its offering to that community. So I think that, yes, the the, the, the world of golf has pockets of awakening to a broader experience that can be created and delivered within the golf, um, the golfing environment and within the different golf venues. I think there's a, a couple of things that stand out for me. Uh, the first one is, if you said to every single golf club management team, would you like to extend the lifetime of every single golfer by five or ten years, would you be interested in that opportunity? I would be very surprised if the answer was ever no. But to actually extend that lifetime of membership, you know, and golf at the minute is not not cheap. It's expensive. Yep. Um, if you extended that by five years for every 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 playing member, then you do you you run the numbers. You can see the size of the opportunity, the the business opportunity. Why it makes such good sense to your point earlier on about retaining golfers yep. for longer. Yeah. The the economic benefit for that the club for the club is great, but also it's the right thing to do because ultimately these customers have given forty years of their business to you. So why wouldn't you want to extend that great uh, that that great experience and that great relationship for another five to ten years? But I think what we need to do is probably upskill and educate the industry as to how to embrace that opportunity. So to have those legacy programs in place, you talked earlier about some different membership models. Well, you know, what What if there was like a, a later life type of membership that wasn't the full access to everything that you can't enjoy anymore, but was giving you the access uh, to the, the social experience, a level of golf experience that maybe is appropriate to you as you age or develop one of these conditions so i think that you know we need to think differently about what that looks like but i think if we get that right then there's a chance to really really extend the lifetime membership and and engagement with golf for for, for most members no i i agree with you but i i think also there's one of the the challenges is that, you know and i've i've been around a number of looked at a number of golf clubs and i'm aware of a number of women who you know, they go, oh, I can't play this course anymore. I'm have to go, going to have to go to an easier one because, you know, it's, it's too much money for me to benefit from this membership at this club. Um, and therefore, they go and look for alternatives. And there are alternatives and that, that's what they go and do. But I think, to your point, why should somebody who may not be physically as able as they used to be um, and may not have the same finances available to them when they were younger, they are now being pushed out of the club that they've been a member for, for 20, 30 years because the club doesn't offer them an experience which um, is it matched to their financial or physical or um, or health way to, you know, or health capacity to be able to enjoy it. And I think that 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 being able to offer different pathways so every golf club has a different experience to offer and i think that's where we could look at how the golf mix experience mix and um, because not every club wants to do that and not every golf club is suitable to be able to have that but having said that there's a huge number of golf clubs around this country who have the space or different access to different facilities or different experiences which will allow them to be able to do, to do that and I think that's more about how we should look at it and engage with organizations or groups of clubs who are interested in doing that. I think that's right and you know that we're looking to create that sort of national network of centers of excellence yeah. and one, one of them one of the, the, the most important things is the actual uh, facilities available to create that center of excellence and I, I often think of the golfing facilities and infrastructure from the golfing perspective in particular is that it's creating that circle of life. Yeah. So basically everyone needs a place to start. Yeah. Everyone needs a place to get better. Yeah. And that's the first uh, stepping stone in their yeah. circle of golfing life. Then they go out and they experience this wonderful thing called an 18 hole golfing experience. And some of those golf courses that they play are 
really, really good ones, championship courses, resort ones when they go on holiday. So that's, if you like, the prime full golfing experience. But there comes a time in life where that's not appropriate or not manageable anymore. Yeah. So that's where those formats that they use when they were starting the game then come back into play. And I think a perfect example for me is one of our venues called Rudding Park. Now, Rudding Park has got this most amazing championship golf course, but it's also got an academy. And in that academy, you've got the most amazing chipping green, putting green, uh, bunker green, practice hole, driving range with all the track man facilities that you talked about earlier. But most important of all, it's got a wonderful, wonderful six hole par three course. Yeah, And that I see that that is perfect for the audiences that we support later in life. But I see people who used to be members at the main club now using that facility on a weekly basis to make sure that they still get their favorite thing into their lives every week. And I think those are the types of infrastructure adjustments that we need. And basically, I suppose what to summarize that, I think every golf course, wherever possible, should have a short course. No, I agree. And I think that's sort of, you know, when you start to look at, you know, how the industry can improve, it is about accepting who their membership is and what the service is to their the, the different demographic who is local to them and who their membership is now and who their membership is in the future. And that's where it goes back to, in my view, is to what is the customer experience that I want to deliver? Why are you coming to my club? What is it that you're looking for? And is it something that I offer? And if it's not something that I offer, is it something I should offer? And if it's not something that I can offer, then basically what is the partner club or organisation that I can refer you to in order for you to have the right experience? The golf community needs to be a community that offers different experiences for different people in different locations. Not every location has to be the same. Therefore, they need to acknowledge and accept that and work together in partnership in order to create a varied and mixed community and and be cooperative rather than competitive. Well, that is a wonderful way to, to, to finish that part of uh, that discussion, because we're just about to move on to the last uh, last part of our little chat, Julie. And this is where I put you on the spot, really, because I give you a crystal ball and I ask you to look into that crystal ball. And I ask you to look maybe 10 years ahead. And what does what what does what does the a, a perfect a perfect well not perfect but a, a better world for women enjoying and discovering golf look like in 10 years time for you julie well i think the first thing is is a central uh, and first thing is an online hub which provides information about what is available to you what is available to you depending on what your access route is so i'm coming in as a new member i'm coming in as a new golfer i'm coming in as a as a somebody who's played sport, I'm coming in as somebody with an illness, I'm coming in as a carer, I'm coming in. Who am I coming in as? What is what are those personas of my access of the of my access into here? And how can I provide information which allows you to decide whether or not golf's the right thing for you based on where you are in your life and what you're looking for? Have you been a sports person and you're looking to extend your competitiveness? Are you somebody that's looking to come for social? Are you somebody that's looking for support from other carers? What is it you're looking for? Are you bringing your dementia parent, husband, partner, whatever it is? Who are you bringing into this world and how can golf help you? Once you have that, you then then have signposts that take you to the different places. Where do you live? What do you want? How far do you want to travel? And this is available to you. And when you get to there, somebody goes, ah, right, okay, you've come in from this environment. You're interested in this. You're coming into our club. This is how we can support you. And this is how we can make sure you get the right experience. So for me, it's like, I've heard of this thing called golf. Apparently, it's going to help me. Why am I going to go there? How am I going to learn about it? What is available to me? And how do I go and walk through the door and experience it in person? That to me is it. And when I get there, they are prepared and ready to support the experience that I'm looking for. That to me is the future. 
I would love to be part of that future, and I'm I'm going to sort of uh, put a little mental mental picture of that crystal ball I gave you and the contents of that crystal ball. I'm just going to keep and cherish that because that's a a brighter future that I think everyone will enjoy not just women but golfers in general people people in society because they'll get that opportunity to have things that they enjoy that they want to do surrounded by wonderful people enjoying some great time and experiences together and isn't that the type of happier healthier life that we all deserve as we as we get older i agree 100 percent. you know to me it's about how do we support and enable and empower people to be able to enjoy it but how do we support and enable and empower people to be able to deliver it? Yeah, that's fantastic. Julie, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for all your time today. It's been an absolute privilege and pleasure to get your insights. And you. uh, yeah, very excited about making sure that that crystal ball dream becomes a reality. So thank Julie, you. thank you very much. Anthony, thank you very much. I've had a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.